All right. Hello, hello, everyone. Minasan, konnichiwa. Thank you so much for joining us uh, this evening here in Atlanta and in the morning in Tokyo, Japan. My name is Yoshi Domoto. I am the executive director of the Japan America Society at Georgia. And so thrilled that you are joining us this evening uh, for our webinar, Tokyo Junkie and a Book Talk with Mr. Robert Whitening, renowned author. But Tokyo Junkie is a memoir that plays out the ever dramatic 60 year growth of the mega city Tokyo, once a dark and fetid backwater, and now the most populous and sophisticated and safe urban capital in the world. We'll follow uh, Mr. Bob Whiting today um, as he watches Tokyo transform during the 1964 Olympics, rub shoulders with the Yakuza, and come face to face with the city's dark underbelly. And as he interviews Japan's baseball elite after publishing his first best selling book on the subject. But without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our moderator this evening and in the morning in Japan uh, from Georgia Tech Center for International Business Education and Research, uh, Cyber, uh, and our co-chair of the Programs Committee, Mr. Jim Hodley. Jim-san, yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Yoroshiku onegaishimasu. Um, first, I wanted to emphasize to everybody we have a, a Q&A tool, so we, if we do have time for questions, uh, if you could put those in the, the Q&A rather than in the chat, that would be uh, fantastic. It helps us to keep track of the questions that are out there. Um, ordinarily, I would give an introduction, um, but Yoshi has done a fantastic job of introducing the book, and really, I think what, what Robert is about to talk about is really a self-introduction, uh, far better than anything that I could do. Uh, I just want to say that I am honored and blessed to be uh, part of, of this presentation by a writer who I have read prodigiously. I've read everything that he's written. Uh, one of my favorite writers, I, he's, he's, he's shaking his head now. I feel I, maybe I'm overdoing it, but it's true. Um, and so without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Mr. Robert Whiting, author of Tokyo Junkie. Thanks a lot, Jim. The, the check is in the mail. Uh, I appreciate that. And Yoshi, thanks a lot. <clears throat> I have a collection of photos here, uh, which show the, the transition of Tokyo from 1962 when I first arrived until the present. Both the, the city and I underwent a major transformation and that transformation was the thematic core of Tokyo Junkie. Uh, Tokyo was a polluted, feted backwater when I first arrived. Uh, next one, next photo. Uh, Tokyo Tower uh, was barely visible in the pollution from the auto uh, and industrial exhaust. Uh, three, I, I'll just call out the numbers, maybe that'll make it easier. Uh, it was so polluted here that everyone wore face masks and there were no oxygen tanks at police boxes for <clears throat> policemen who were overcome by fog. Uh, when I, I was a 19-year-old GI when I first arrived and got my first glimpse of the city. It was unbelievably crowded at rush hour, as in this Tokyo Station photo, platform pushers were needed. Uh, the city was one big uh, construction site in an effort to get ready for the 1964 Olympics. Tokyo had virtually no modern infrastructure at the time, just narrow roads and old low buildings with only one five-star hotel, the Imperial, <clears throat> which was falling into disrepair. Eight expressways were in the process of being built when I arrived along with 10,000 new buildings. You could stand in Shinjuku or uh, a Ginza and watch as buildings were being torn down on one side of the street and put up on another. The energy of the city was just incredible. Uh, here two new subway lines were also being built and canals uh, were being filled in underneath the highways. Uh, traffic congestion, as you can see, was terrible. Streetcars had to be removed to facilitate Olympic construction. Uh, this was what the Ginza looked like when I first arrived. Uh, and this is what Akasaka Mitsuke looked like when I first arrived. Hotel Otani was being built off to the right. 
Uh, only one quarter of all the residences in Tokyo had flush toilets. Vacuum trucks sucked out the waste from most houses and dumped it into Tokyo Bay. Uh, waste was also deposited in so-called honey buckets for transport to the rice paddies outside the city to use as fertilizer. The city was quite odiferous. I was assigned to Fuchu Air Station about 30 minutes from Shinjuku on the Keio Line. I was an electronic intelligence analyst working for the CIA, which was making secret U-2 flights over Russia three times a week. It was a 45 minute train ride by a uh, 45 minute ride by train and subway to Ginza, 25 minutes on the Keio line, 20 minutes on the Marunouchi subway line to the Ginza. At the time, Life magazine called Tokyo the most dynamic city in the world. Uh, the population of Tokyo proper was 10 million, making it the largest city in the world. The population of greater the greater Tokyo metropolitan area was 18 million about half what it is uh, today. Here in this photo, it's mid afternoon, but the smog restricts visibility. It was said that there were more bars and restaurants per square kilometer in Tokyo than any other city in the world. This photo of bar girls uh, taken at the time by French photographer William Klein is a classic, it typifies the era. Americans were well liked at the time, primarily because of JFK and his wife, Jackie. Robert Kennedy visited Wasati University in 1962 and drew enormous crowds. A popular nightclub was the showboat in Shibashi, constructed in the shape of a Mississippi riverboat. Scenes in the hit film Bridges at Tokuri with William Holden and Grace Kelly were filmed there. The Golden Gitsu Seikai was another hot spot. The Girls were dressed like Playboy bunnies, which was a big uh, global phenomenon at the time. Japanese businessmen took uh, visiting foreign guests there. Everyone was learning English to cater to the expected incoming influx of foreign uh, tourists uh, coming to the games. A popular figure was named Larry Allen, who played the piano at the Club 88 and the Golden Gate nightclubs in Tokyo. I spent a lot of time in Shibuya. This is what the famous crossing in Shibuya looked like back then. A famous street in Shibuya was Love Letter Alley, where Japanese women could have letters uh, written for them to their overseas boyfriends. Uh, they could have these letters that they'd written translated into English and other languages. The Happy Valley Dance Hall was another uh, popular spot. The Ando gang ran Shibuya, and I was once invited to one of the, their gambling dens. Chohan and Hanafuda were the standard dice and card games run by his gang. Ando Noboto Lee became a movie star and starred in films about his adventures. You can see him sitting next to the dealer in that photo. Up <clears throat> to the right, yes, that's him. Uh, preparations for the games were frantic. When I first arrived in Japan, you couldn't drink the tap water. Rats were everywhere. One after another, the, the Olympic venues went up. Particular striking was Kenzo Tange's Yoyogi National Gymnasium. It won the Pritzker Prize for architecture. Also impressive was the Komazawa Olympic Park and Olympic Park Stadium shown here. The Okada and four other five-star hotels opened up. Among them, was the, ho the hotel the hotel no Tani featured in the James Bond film You Only Live Twice? On October 1st, the bullet train, the fastest train in the world, the Shinkansen, began operations. The Tokyo Olympics served as Japan's re-entry to the world after defeat in war. Never before had so many foreigners been in the city at one time, save for the occupation when they were not exactly welcome. The opening ceremony brought tears to the eyes of many Japanese. The torture bearer was a survivor of the Hiroshima atomic uh, bombing. There were three events that stood out for the Japanese. One was the open weight in judo. Dutchman Anto Hazing, shown here, defeated Japan champion Akio Kaminaga 
it was a devastating blow to the national pride. And many people had thought that superior technique and fighting spirit could vanquish a much larger foreigner. The second event was the marathon. Kokichi uh, Tsuburaya lost the silver medal in the marathon, a closely watched event broadcast on national TV after surrendering a big lead in the final lap around the national stadium track. Afterward, he apologized profusely. He later committed suicide. The third event was the women's volleyball final. The Japanese women's volleyball team, dubbed Witches of the Orient by a Moscow newspaper, redeemed Japanese pride and faith in fighting spirit. They defeated a bigger, stronger Soviet squad on the final day, uh, thanks to uh, their gold medal was uh, the result of a brutal 11 hour a day training regimen they'd done for two years. The final point of this uh, final match was watched by 95% of the viewing population, a record that still stands. There was a dark side to the Olympics, however. The bullet train cost so much money there was not enough funds to buy land to finish the monorail, originally intended to run from Haneda to Shimbashi or Tokyo Station. Instead, it ended at inconvenient Hamamatsu show. The lack of funds to purchase land meant that highways had to be built over public domain water instead. The pillars planted in the water to support the overhead roadways destroyed marine life in the Kandu River, as well as the traditional uh, Nihonbashi River commerce culture. The famous view of Mount Fuji from the bridge disappeared. Still, Central Tokyo had such cachet after the Olympics that the James Bond crew filmed You Only Live Twice There. Here, Sean Connery is shown filming a scene at the Koku Gikan. Uh, I took a discharge uh, from the US Air Force in 1964 and I found a small apartment in Komagome. I enrolled at Sophia University. I taught English to make a living. I taught at a bank in Ryogoku near the Asakusakan Temple. My students told me matter of factly of the destruction of the B-29 bombers. The eastern half of Tokyo had been obliterated. Tens of thousands of people were burned alive. It was mortifying. I like to spend time in Tokyo iz Izakaya, a great invention that was a combination of British pubs and Spanish tapestries. Uh, Ann Dinkins, New York Deli was an, another popular spot. Uh, I spent a lot of time at the movies watching samurai films. As, <clears throat> Ken Tucker Kuda was the number one star in Japan at the time. He made 10 movies a year. He and Koji Suruta teamed up in several films. The climactic scenes of these movies were invariably filled with sword fights and geysers of blood splattered across the screen, all in defense of the honor of the clan. When I became a Sophia student, uh, I became an English teacher to uh, the popular Yomiuri Shimbun reporter Tsuneo Watanabe, who taught me in return about political corruption. I went to his house three times a year. He told me that he thought Prime Minister Eisaku Sato at the time was the most corrupt politician in all of Japan. Sato was a man who sent his wife to offer cash payments to Watanabe's wife in an effort to stop Watanabe from criticizing him in print. Sato's brother, Nobusuke Kishi, was an infamous war crime suspect who sold out to the Americans and helped ram through the security treaty extension in 1960, keeping American bases in Japan. This over massive protests from the public by using organized crime Yakuza. He was stabbed here by a paid assailant believed to have been hired by a political opponent of Kishi. The recently resigned Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was Kishi's grandson and Sato's grandnephew, in case you didn't know, it helped to have relatives in politics in Japan. I joined student protests against the war in Vietnam, like this one in Shinjuku. Protests were often violent, befitting the 1960s, much more so than today. 
1968, Tokyo University students commandeered Yasuro Hall, initiating a violent battle with riot police. Students also protested land appropriations to build Narita Airport. Japanese baseball was another passion I developed. I regularly attended games at Karakuen Stadium, sitting in the jumbo stands uh, above left field. Baseball was by far the most popular sport in Japan and the Yomiuri Giants were the most popular team. A favorite player was Sadahara O on the left who embodied the essence of, martial, of the martial arts approach to baseball that defined the Japanese game. O practiced slicing sl strips of paper in half with a samurai sword. Here he trains with his teammate, golden boy Shigeo Nagashima. The samurai inspired martial arts ethos, stressed endless training, development of spirit and self-sacrifice the polar opposite of the American approach. I was addicted to the hugely popular anime series, Kyoji no Hoshi, about a boy who undergoes brutal daily training under his father to become a professional baseball player. From age 10 to age 16, for example, he is made to wear a special vest of steel springs to build strength, making it difficult even to drink a glass of water. He is forbidden to remove it, even when sleeping or taking a bath. Here's a page from the manga version. This series and Japanese baseball in general inspired me to write the chrysanthemum and the bat about how the adopted Japanese game reflected the national character. In the end, the boy grows up to become a giant star. In 1968, the Kasumi Gaseki built building went up. At 36 stories, it was the tallest building in Asia at the time. It was the subject of a hit movie, a hit Toho movie. It inspired a wave of skyscraper construction, mostly focused in Shinjuku in the beginning. In 1969, I joined the uh, editorial staff of Encyclopedia Britannica, which was based there in Shinjuku. Sorry for this bad quality. Shinjuku became a favorite haunt. You could get anything you wanted in Kabuki Cho. At this bar for uh, back one, sorry. At this bar, for example, the waitresses dressed in nurses uniforms. They served you a beer and then they checked your blood pressure for you. I lived in Higashi Nakano, uh, two stops from uh, Shinjuku on the Chuo line. Uh, I met my future wife, Machiko, in 1972. Uh, here is a, on a trip to Manila. And I also spent a lot of time in underworld haunts. This is uh, Shibuya Golden Guy area. I became friends with, the member, with members of the Sumiyoshi Kai, Tokyo's leading gang. I had a friend in the gang who looked something like this guy on the right. He said to me, I'm Okinawan and Japanese don't like Okinawans. You're American and Japanese don't like Americans. So let's be friends. He introduced me to his boss who liked the, liked the fact that I wrote my graduate thesis on the Liberal Democratic Party. He said, we support the LDP. We get out to vote and raise money for them. And in return, they give us construction contracts. Here's another Sumiyoshi gangster. No connection to me, but I just really like the picture. I moved to New York in 1973 for three years. I lived at 68 West 82nd Street in Central Park West, a fourth floor walk-up. Machiko went to Case Western Reserve on a scholarship and visited on weekends. It was here that I wrote the chrysanthemum and the bat. I sent a copy of the first draft to Daryl Spencer, a major league player who had played for the Honky Braves and was living in Wichita. He said, I flew out to see him and he said, this is the first book I've ever read. But among the many interesting observations about Japan he offered me was this advice to Americans who go to play there. He said, the key to understanding Japan is to think backwards. This means always show up early to practice, never argue with the coach, never swing at the first pitch and don't ever play practical jokes on your teammates 
Japanese just don't understand them. I also wrote a chapter on Sadaharu Oh, who became a national figure in the US as he approached Hank Aaron's world home run record. Here, O oh has just hit member 756 to pass O. Oh. That's he saw Harimoto, the all time hits king, leaping in the air behind him. After nearly three years in New York, I moved back to Tokyo to work for Time Watch. This is what the Ginza looked like on Christmas Day, 1975. After living in crime-ridden New York City, it was great to be back in a civilized city. This is a rooftop beer garden in the summer during that era. Machiko and I lived in Riki Mansion. It sat next to uh, the adjoining building Riki Apartments. It was the first Western-style apartment complex in Tokyo. It was built in the late 50s by the hugely popular professional wrestling icon Riki Doza. My upstairs neighbor was the iconic giant Baba, the six foot 10 inch professional wrestler. I could hear him practicing backflips upstairs, knocking plaster from the ceiling onto our uh, dinner table. Uh, here I'm working with our cat, one of my closest advisors. Here, there's my time life uh, office during my hippie phase. Chrysanthemum in the back came out in 1977. It was featured in uh, Time Magazine. And it was a bestseller in translation titled Kikuto Bato. That's Owa Nagashima on the cover there at the, the shrine doing a preseason prayer. Machiko and I got married. Here we are at the festival in Akasaka near Riki Mansion with her family in Omiya in 1982. Uh, with the success of Chrysanthemum Bat, I became a freelance writer. I interviewed many memorable figures like Clyde Wright, former California Angel star. He set a record for fines and ejections in Japan. His nickname was Crazy Wright. Another memorable interview was with the Destroyer, a popular foreign wrestler in Japan who also appeared on a weekly TV variety show. He was more popular than Steve McQueen and Alan DeLong in the country. His name was more recognizable even than Lockheed, embroiled, which was embroiled in a national bribery scandal in Japan at the time. Here the Destroyer is wrestling the great Ricky Dozon. I interviewed the Destroyer for six hours. I made the mistake of asking him if professional wrestling was fake. He responded by putting the figure four leg lock on me and nearly breaking my leg. Here I am with Roy White, the former New York Yankee outfielder who played for the Yomiuri Giants. My old man and Roy was so like the reporter once said, it's too bad he's not Japanese, he could stay here for him. Giants present manager Tatsunori Hara is off to the right, number eight. He was the third baseman at the time. Leon Lee was another uh, foreign player who was well liked. He said of playing in Japan, it's different, sure, and it's difficult with all the practices and the regimentation. But when you are invited to somebody's house, you don't complain about the decor or the food they serve. You're a guest. Be respectful. Here I am with Professor Masaru Ike of, of Keio University at a ball game in Kawasaki, the worst stadium in Japan. Uh, the place smelled of whiskey and, and urine and, and vomit. It was so bad that, there, that the stands were perpetually empty. Reggie Smith, the former uh, Boston Red Sox and Los Angeles Dodger uh, outfielder, played for Yomiuri. He said fans shouted racial insults at him playing right field in Koshien Stadium in Osaka, home of the arch rival Hanshin Tigers. Uh, but he said they could not get the pronunciation right, and it made him laugh instead. Here I am interviewing uh, Rook Shields, who came to Japan to film commercials. I invited her to go to an izakaya with me, but her mother wouldn't let her. She was only 16 years old. Uh, Greg here I am with Greg Davis on the left, a well-known photog Asian photographer, Tim Porter, another photographer my brother at the end and my wife on the right pretending to have a good time. In the late 
the 70s and 80s, Japan dominated global trade with superior cars, cameras, TVs, and other products. Uh, an era of explosive growth known as the bubble era began. The 1985 Plaza Accord had effectively doubled the value of the yen against major currencies. Tokyo was transformed again during this period with new building complexes like Arc Hills shown here popping up. The city was awash in money. Half the cash in the world was in Japanese hands. Expensive foreign cars began to appear on the street. People could eat sushi sprinkled with gold dust. It seemed like one giant party. A uh, symbol of decadence was Juliana's nightclub, where once demure office girls got up on a giant stage and, and danced in their underclothes. My wife was recruited by the UNHCR during this period and had to move to Geneva. So we kept our Akasaka apartment and I began a life of round the world airplane tickets for the next 38 years. I would go back and forth two or three times a year. Uh, bubble era gangsters acting on behalf of banks forced recalcitrant in Tokyo landlords to sell their properties for redevelopment, forcing many tenants out. In the midst of this, I moved to Kamakura. Uh, I published You Gotta Have Wa in 1989, a book about the inability of uh, Japanese and Americans to get along here. Uh, Time Magazine wrote a story about it. Uh, Japan was a big topic in the US and the book was a bestseller there. Uh, here's a book party uh, for the Japanese language uh, publication of You Gotta Have War. Uh, another set of shots. Uh, Here's a train poster for You Gotta Have Law. Well, this is the only time in my life that I shared a poster with Tom Cruise and Michael J. Fox. A subway poster here for Law. And this is a, a photo of the hardcover for Law. Uh, here's an appearance on Larry King and a feature in the uh, International Herald Tribune. Uh, Shintaro Ishihara was a man who could say no, the man who could say no to America. He wrote this book, The Japan That Can Say No, with Morita Akio, said, uh, invited me to lunch. Uh, I said yes. He, during the lunch, uh, I was quite impressed with him. He quoted Balzac and Dostoevsky, and he ordered expensive French wines. We were at the capital of Tokyo Hotel near the Diet Building. Ishihara was America's fiercest critic, and I had called him the devil in the U.S.-Japan relationship in a magazine article, and which he read, and he invited me to lunch. His purpose was to convince me otherwise. Uh, and when the lunch, the next day, he sent me a, an invitation to a political reception where he was giving a speech. It was one which I was required to make a donation to his campaign of thirty thousand yen. So this time I had to say no. Tokyo Dome was another symbol of bubble era excess. The Yomiuri Giant, this opened up in 1987. The Yomiuri Giants reported 56,000 yen for every game they, 56,000 people, excuse me, for every game they played. I counted the capacity and the capacity was only 42,761 seats and there's a, a sign in the, the, the lower level of the basement uh, confirming this. Uh, there were 42,761 seats. I counted them all. And I counted the standing room, which was about 3,500. I wrote a column about it in the Shukan Asahi. Uh, so the, the, uh, the Omiri Giants banned me from the stadium for, for doing that. The 1986 Yasu, Prime Minister Yasuhiro Nakasone hosted the G7 in Tokyo. It was Japan's uh, great moment in the sun. You can see Reagan and Thatcher and Cole and uh, Mitterrand, you know, all the world leaders there. The Nikkei hit an all-time 
our peak, the Nikkei Dow average hit an all-time peak in 1989, uh, 39,000 something. Uh, Japan at this time had half the cash in the world. Then it began a long, slow descent downward, losing over 80% of its value over the next several years. I met Nick Cepetti, pictured here on the right, as a young black marketeer during the occupation. He was 70 years old in 1990. He'd made and lost several fortunes. He'd been divorced three times, arrested 12 times, deported once. He had close gangland ties. And so it was at this time that I began working on Tokyo Underworld. Uh, people talk about the 1990s as the lost decade, but what was impressive to me was the amount of construction that continually went on. Municipal planning was nonstop and the government always found the money or, or they printed it. The Tokyo Metropolitan Government known as Tocho went up, that's this building here, was many other, one of many other notable structures, including Shinjuku Park Tower, housing the park, Hyatt, which is where the film Lost in Translation was made. Uh, Tokyo had twice as many architects as New York City. This is uh, the Rainbow Bridge was constructed at the time. It's offered one of the most uh, impressive cityscape views in the world. You can see what, here what a beautiful city uh, Tokyo had become. Uh, also connecting the two sides, uh, the was uh, a, you know newly constructed uh, uh, reclaimed land and, and the, this island called Odaiba was the Yurikamome, which traversed uh, Tokyo Bay all the way from Toyosu to Shimbashi. In 1995, uh, a reporter told me that there were three terrible events. One was the Saudi gas attack on a Tokyo subway. And the second was the Kobe earthquake, which killed 6,433 people. The third was the defection to the US major leagues by Kentetsu Buffalo's pitcher, Hideo Nomo. He became the first Japanese player to go there in 30 years. Nomo was a pariah, but only until he became a star in America and suddenly he became a hero. That's our boy over there beating the Americans, you would hear people say. He helped eliminate the image of Japan existing at the time as one of faceless people who could only make products like cameras, automobiles, and TV sets. As the famous writer Midori Masu Masujima put it, he helped Japanese finally become members of the world. In 1999, Tokyo Underworld was published. DreamWorks purchased an option, the first of five studios to do so. The translation of Tokyo Underworld hit number one in Tokyo bookstores. It's advertised here on this uh, train poster. It caused quite a stir and I was interviewed in several publications. Ginzamachi, shown here, the crime boss of Tokyo whom I wrote about in great detail was not happy. He sent two letters to me, one in Japanese and one in English, claiming that Tokyo Underworld had left him deeply distressed. He said he wanted to meet me at his office. I showed the two letters to my editor and his face turned pale. He said the Japanese language letter had menacing undertones beginning as it did with the phrase, we hope this finds you in good health, meaning that you're not going to be in good health much longer. After some discussion, I decided to meet him with a Katakawa lawyer and a photographer. With sudden illness in Machi's family postponed the meeting. Uh, his wife died, I learned, and then he died not long after that. His lawyers explained the situation to me, however. They said he wanted to be portrayed as a good guy in the movie. He had a letter from General Douglas MacArthur praising him for fighting communists during the occupation. He would show it to immigration authorities in Hawaii whenever he visited and they would let him go in, but, but ban other Yakuza. Uh, here, the Sumiyoshi gangster Katsushi Murata was also unhappy. 
This is a man who stabbed Ricky Dozon in a fight at the new Latin Quarter and eventually caused his demise. Uh, I'd put his mugshot in the book. Uh, he said that we had done it without his permission. He said we had hurt his daughter's chances of a successful career as a professional wrestler and demanded 2 million yen in compensation. The publisher said no. Arata glared at him and said, be careful on the subway platform going home. Don't stand too close to the edge. You never know when someone might push you. Here's the photo of Murata older and suit and tie. So after that, I took different ho routes home every night for a long while. And after a while, you just get tired of being scared and you go on with your life. Uh, the building in, in Tokyo continued nonstop uh, as the city entered the 21st century. The star attraction was Rapungi Hills, which opened up in 2005. <clears throat> However, the layout was very confusing. It also became known for drug use and white collar crime. My wife said they should just drop a bomb on the place. Uh, another new structure was Kasukabe Tunnel, an underground flood control system in Saitama. Its official name was uh, a not very romantic metropolitan area outer underground discharge channel. There were also continual additions to the highway system. 280 kilometers worth of highway was added after the 1964 Olympics. More than 30 kilometers was added before the, this last Tokyo Olympics. Uh, that's I, in LA and New York, I don't think they've done much uh, uh, new highway construction at all. Uh, the Sky Tree, Tokyo's tallest tower, the world's tallest tower, sorry, was an, another addition to the Tokyo skyline. It went up in 2010. My home Toyosu Towers, shown here, went up in 2009. Uh, here's a view of, of Toyosu area uh, where the new fish market is. Uh, here's a view of Rapungi Hills. Uh, and the new city center Odaiba in the distance, uh, the artificial island in Tokyo Bay. Uh, on March 11th, the uh, Fukushima earthquake and tsunami struck. This was the scene in Miyagi City. Here as well is Miyagi City. Tohoku towns were overwhelmed. Entire towns were wiped off the face of the earth. There's a, a a propane plant explosion in Chiba. It was visible from the 20th floor of the Yorokso Denki building in Tokyo. Uh, here I'm uh, emceeing a press conference with Major League Baseball Commissioner Rob Manfred, the man who took the All-Star game away from Atlanta. In March 2020, the coronavirus first hit. Here, April 7th, that near Tokyo Governor Yuri Kokoike is urging people to stay home and avoid contact with others. Kengo Kuma National Stadium had already gone up. 45 new skyscrapers had also gone up during the uh, four years preceding the scheduled opening of the Olympic Games in uh, July 2020. Uh, the spring of 2020, the Olympics were postponed. Here I'm at the military sauna hotel in Tokyo with my wife. Shinagawa Station, May 1st, 2020. It's the first day of the first state of emergency in Tokyo. Uh, here's the deserted street in Shibuya uh, on the same day during the first state of emergency. But Tokyo ranked fairly low on the list of COVID deaths thanks to natural hygienic practices, customs, Japanese customs of no hugging, no kissing, wearing face masks uh, when you have cold or flu. Uh, and so they're, you know, they had something like one tenth of the deaths that New York City had. Uh, here's the Tokyo sunset uh, as viewed from the sky tree. 
uh, in 2018, uh, TripAdvisor rated Tokyo the world's leading tourist destination, ranking at the top in several categories, including local friendliness, taxi services, cleanliness, and public transportation. In November 2020, Global Finance deemed uh, back one. Sorry, not yet. Never 2020 global finance deemed Tokyo the most livable city in the world, according to a number of metrics, including a COVID-19 health conditions. The city was number one in a number of areas, highest GDP, most Fortune 500 global headquarters, cleanest, uh, most extensive and most efficient subway and train system in the world, lowest crime rate, most Michelin starred restaurants, twice as many three-star restaurants as Paris, highest literacy, literacy rate, longest life expectancy. Here's Shibuya Crossing, uh, present day, it's become world famous, 10 lanes of traffic, five crosswalks, the bus busiest intersection in the world, <clears throat> in the most organized city in the world. Uh, here's my 77th birthday with my wife and her relatives. Uh, this was at the Mandarin Oriental Hotel in, in Nihonbashi. Uh, so that's it for my talk. We got a few photos here remaining if we want to run through them. That's me and my Hollywood phase. Uh, this is a photo of Mount Fuji and the high rises in Shinjuku. I really like this photo because it looks like the buildings are facing Mount Fuji and paying their respects. Uh, next one is, uh, this was the 1960 security treaty uh, demonstrations. Over a million people demonstrated around the Diet Building at that time. And organized crime was called out to help. Next one, uh, riot police. It was so big that there weren't enough riot police to control them all, so they used organized crime. In fact, the head of this, the, the uh, Inagawa Kai was uh, inside the Diet on the night that the security treaty extension was ratified, was voted upon. He and his men were barricading the door so the leftists couldn't get in. Uh, where are we? What's the next one? Okay, this is uh, the top photo is October 1st, 1964, 10 days before the Olympics when the bullet train made its first run. That's the famous Nichigeki music hall in the background. This is in Yurakcho and you to the right of the building uh, underneath this uh, overpass is where the uh, Skiabashi uh, police station is located and it's a uh, uh, a two block walk and you're right in the center of the Ginza. Uh, the lower photo is taken in, uh, was taken in 2017. Uh, shows the Nichigeki Music Hall it was torn down in the 1980s and this is the Hankyu department store that was put up in its place. This photo I think was taken from the uh, roof of the Imperial Hotel, which is a couple of blocks away. And off to the left out of the picture is the Rakshu Denki building where the, the Foreign Correspondents Press Club was located for many, many years on the 20th floor. Uh, next one, is he Deo Nomo? Well, I think this was his last year in the, in the major leagues when he, he was trying out for Kansas City. Uh, uh, he put on a little weight. I guess he liked American hamburgers or something. Uh, Next one, uh, this is uh, taken a few years ago with my work. All right, that's it. <clears throat> I'm finished. Uh, thanks for listening. Uh, I'm happy to take any and all questions that you have. Great, thank you very much, uh, Robert, for a fantastic walk through uh, that much history of, of Tokyo. And uh, if, I encourage people to to purchase the book because it's it if you enjoyed the presentation that you just saw it's more of of that in in even more detail um and to purchase uh, his other books as well let's let's look and see um what questions we have from our audience um first question that we have is from an anonymous attendee 
Um, why do you think Tokyo was able to transform so quickly from the post-war era to what it is today? Uh, <clears throat> well, <clears throat> Tokyo didn't trans, you know, transform itself all that quickly. <clears throat> you look at pictures of Tokyo in uh, the late 40s and 50s, you know, it was a uh, a lot of devastation. I mean, half of Tokyo was wiped out by the B-29 bombers. And uh, there were, you know, a few buildings were left in, in the Ginza Hibiya area, which MacArthur and uh, they took over to run the occupation. Uh, there were a lot of jerry-built buildings, you know, <clears throat> you know, built uh, really quickly and shabbily and just so they could get the economy up and running again. Uh, but it wasn't until the the Japanese got the Olympic bid in 1958 that, you know, they started serious reconstruction. And most people thought at the time, you know, how in the heck are they ever going to get ready? Because at the time they only had uh, no building over 10 stories, only one five-star hotel, the Imperial, which was falling into disrepair, uh, no major infrastructure, just low, narrow, uh, narrow uh, roads. Uh, so it was amazing what, what they did in just a, a, a short period. In the span of five years, they, you know, they transformed Japan from uh, Tokyo from this third world backwater into major high-tech megalopolis. It was amazing. And in fact, there were a year and a half before the Olympics started, most people didn't think they were going to make it on time. And you, they couldn't find a head of the uh, Olympic uh, preparation committee because nobody thought that they could do it. But I remember they went on this 24-7 uh, uh, phase in which uh, they would be working 24, you know, 24 hours a day, all night. If you stayed in Tokyo, uh, they, you know, they started tearing up the streets to build the subways and uh, pile drivers going off. So, you, you know, construction lights everywhere. You stayed in Tokyo, you needed black curtains to hide out the construction, to block out the construction lights. And uh, you needed earplugs because these pile drivers were going on all night. And somehow they did it. It was just amazing. It was a miracle. It's the proper word, I think. Um, I have a question from uh, the chat and then we'll uh, hop over to the Q&A. Uh, the first, uh, the question is oh, uh, from Joe Cheverly. How did Tokyo control smog in the 1970s? Uh, they didn't. It was very smoggy. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, they'd have these petrochemical smog warnings and it was really bad. It was in the 80s that they started getting it under control. Because a lot of these citizen groups complained when people were getting sick. Uh, and so it was uh, public pressure, put pressure on, on the, the local government to clean it up. And, and they did, you know, the, uh, you can actually fish off the docks in Toyosa where I live right now, which is an amazing thing. You couldn't before because there were no live fish. They were all dead from the sludge. And, and they're still, I believe, working towards that, uh, dealing with uh, banning talking about banning uh, diesel engine trucks in certain areas of downtown, if I recall correctly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, another question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, what was your experience in Tokyo leading up to and during the 2020, 2021 Summer Olympics? And maybe if you could contrast them to 1964. Well, <clears throat> you know, it was a state of emergency and the Olympics had to be held uh, the 2020 Olympics had, were postponed to 2021 and they had to be held in a bubble. And so the athletes who came in had to be quarantined for two weeks. Uh, reporters who came in from overseas to cover the Olympics had to be quarantined too. Uh, so in 1964, <clears throat> uh, I remember you could walk down the street and you could see in the center of Tokyo and you'd see these athletes going, going in and out of department stores and there'd be a big poster of uh, Bob Hayes uh, on the side of the department store or Charcheska, the Czech, the blonde Czech gymnast or uh, Abe Baby Kila, the Ethiopian marathon runner. Uh, 
and they were interviewed on TV and you, there was just, it felt like an international festival, which was the Olympics are supposed to be like, right? But not this time, because you never saw the athletes. And uh, that NHK, the news, they had 17 straight days of reporting on Japanese gold medal winners. That's all. I mean, it was really, you know, uncomfortable to watch. It's supposed to be, you know, hosting an international event, but all they could, event, but all they could you know, uh, show on their programs were Japanese medalists. So, you know, the, uh, the 1964 Olympics were uh, a transformational event and they're truly historic, transformed the city, transformed the, the mindset of the people. But 2021 is like a, a blip, you know, there's nothing memorable about it. Do you think there will be a, a similar level of excitement from when the Shinkansen first opened, when they get the... Uh, the Chuo Shinkansen up and running to Nagoya. That's the maglev for those in the audience. Oh, yeah, maybe. I, I don't know. I, I have to write on it first. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but how, how fast is that, uh, the maglev going to go? Is that the 400 mile an hour one? Uh, it's, it's incredibly fast. I don't remember the specs right off the top of my head, but yeah, it, it is. So it is, they, they take a two hour trip and, and, and make it into an hour trip, right? Uh, yeah, they actually, the, the statement is they, it turns Nagoya into a, into a, a suburb of Tokyo because you can be there in 90 minutes. Uh, <laughs> wow, well, yeah, I know. They've been talking about Magna. They were supposed to have demonstrations before the, the uh, 2020 Olympics, but it you know, didn't work out. Mm. Uh, from our uh, Q&A, we have one from uh, Johnny Denise, we, a very uh, personal and up-to-date question. Uh, hi, Bob. If you were a mid-20-year-old moving to Tokyo in 2022, what ward or area would you choose to live in? I'd live in Toyosu, the Toyosu area. <clears throat> I mean, there are lots of residential apartments going up uh, all over the city, and there's a lot in Toyosu. But there's a lot, a lot of space. I mean, Tokyo is a fairly compact, uh, crowded area. But Toyosu, they, there's a, intentionally made a lot more space. Uh, it's one of these. It's a work-life project that the city has been, been planning for a long time. Like I can look at, I'm sitting in the sixth floor of an apartment uh, building, about three blocks from the water, overlooking the water. And uh, in front of my building, there's a Little League ballpark. A block away is the headquarters of the local branch of the, of the NTT building. And there's a Viva Homes uh, a block away from that. Uh, there's a huge uh, shopping center right on the water with a, you know, a, a 16 screen ultra modern uh, movie theater complex. Uh, and it's just very pleasant. Uh, I would, so I would stay, I would stay there. And it's only, it's a, uh, a 10 minute ride into modern Ochi in Tokyo station, uh, subway ride to Chiraksha and then you walk down to where the new press club is. So you're, it's right in the heart of the city and beautiful views. Um, a, a question for, from myself and, and I'm, I apologize for the disorganized nature of it because I'm kind of thinking of it while I'm saying it. There's been a lot of attention brought recently to, um, you know, it, it goes through phases and there's an in, a rising interest again in the Yakuza that's driven by popular culture, uh, video games, TV series, things like that. Um, and there's been a lot of statements that the Yakuza are really a shadow of their former selves. Is that a function of government action to weaken them? Or is that, in your opinion, more of a function of that they've gotten older and have to some degree moved more towards a semi-legitimate existence? Uh, I think it's, you know, police action mostly, you know, <clears throat> around the turn of the century, the night in the late 1990s, the police Actually, from 1990 on, the police have been trying to crack down on the Yakuza. <clears throat> when I was going to uh, 
the university. I was living in Higashi Nakano. Uh, after that, there were yakuza everywhere. There were 180,000 registered members of organized crime. The Sumiyoshi Kai, the Tokyo's largest gang, ran the area. So I got to know some of these people. Uh, you know, the yakuza had a better reputation back then because they'd helped the police fight the communists. There was a real threat of a communist takeover uh, after the war. And uh, because Mao had taken over China and North Korea had become a powerful communist state. Uh, so there was, and MacArthur had, uh, had disarmed all the uh, Tokyo police and now uh, the military had to turn in their weapons. There was no army. And so there was a real worry that, you know, Japan wouldn't be able to defend itself. So they, you know, the Yakuza helped out. In fact, when the security treaty was scheduled to be signed, Eisenhower, the president, was supposed to visit Tokyo uh, for the signing and ride into a limousine, in a limousine with the emperor of Japan from Haneda Airport into central Tokyo. But his press secretary, James Haggerty, came on an advance visit and his car was surrounded by angry leftists and he had to be rescued by helicopter. <clears throat> so the government was worried they wouldn't be able to protect the president. So they developed this force of 25,000 people uh, uh, made up of Yakuza and Ultraritis. And they were going to be stationed along the way from Haneda into the US embassy in the center of Tokyo on either side of the road, there'd be every three meters, there'd be a guy standing with a bamboo stave to put on either side of the street. And uh, so at that time in the 1960s, the, the Yakuza had a kind of uh, respect from the general public because of what they'd done, even though they were involved in a lot of shady things, you know, gambling, prostitution, uh, some. Uh, you know, protection industry, uh, money loan, uh, money, uh, loan sharking. Uh, but when, when I was living in Higashi Nakano in the late 60s and early 70s, you know, you could walk into the local Sumiyoshi office. You wanted to borrow some money, they'd loan it to you uh, at, you know, usurious rates. But, uh, and, or if you, somebody owed you money and they weren't paying it back, you could ask the Yakuza for help. Because at that time, there were very few lawyers and it was difficult to sue. The Japanese didn't like <clears throat> lawsuits. The Japanese government didn't want Japan to turn into another America where people were suing each other at the drop of a hat. So the gangs would do this for you. And they would always say, we're not like the mafia. You know, we help protect the, the community. We keep the crazy people off the streets. You know, we bring order and discipline and blah, blah, blah. But, you know, the bubble era, the Yakuza really got carried away, you know, with threatening landlords to, with murder and to get them to sell their properties so they could take advantage of these skyrocketing prices. So the police is police superintendent decided he was going to take them down. And so they passed a bunch of laws that made it illegal to join a Japanese gang. And uh, you, uh, if you were or a member of organized crime, if you were wearing a badge, uh, you could not uh, open a bank account. And you could not run a business. And if you were an ordinary person doing business with one of these people, you, they'd out you, they'd print your name in the newspaper. So the number of Yakuza have dropped to about 20,000 now, I think. And But, you know, the cocaine use has quadrupled. Child prostitution has quadrupled. There's just as much crime as before. So it's just going underground. It's turning to different hangure, they call them, the bosos open, the motorcycle gangs. So it's just gone underground. And there, before you could run, walk down the street in Shibuya or Shinjuku in Kabuki Cho, and there'd be yakuza all over the place. They'd stop you on the street, and say, "Hey, come on, hey guys, you can come come to our bar." And uh, but now you you, it's it's hard to see one. It's, I mean, it's hard to find one, exactly. So yeah, it's a big change. Crime is just as, as you know, 
active as it was before. Sorry for the long answer, but I'm fantastic. thinking a lot about that. Yeah, fantastic, absolutely. Uh, well, I, I see Yoshi has turned on his camera and uh, that's usually my cue that we have, have reached the end of our assigned time. Uh, I wanna thank you on behalf of everybody who was able to participate and uh, the people who are also viewing streaming on, on YouTube as well. Um, and again, to encourage everybody first to, to say a big uh, round of thank you to you for a fantastic talk and to encourage everyone, if you have not read uh, uh, Robert's books, please go out and, and buy them all. So. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Robert, for joining us again and uh, sharing just a fascinating history of Tokyo's past 60 years plus. Um, I certainly learned a whole lot uh, on my part, and uh, um, we will definitely be looking forward to what Tokyo has in store for us, I guess, in the next 60 years, right? But uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, we certainly look forward to kind of uh, hopefully maybe inviting you to Atlanta. Maybe you can uh, talk to us in person. Uh, but yeah, I, as uh, Jim mentioned, definitely uh, check out all of uh, Robert's books, uh, including Tokyo Junkie, um, all available on Amazon. Uh, but uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we do have a lot of other upcoming events uh, this month and next month. Uh, actually, this weekend, uh, we have our Japanese Art and Culture Workshop Luncheon at Nakato Japanese Restaurant, uh, the first Japanese restaurant to open up in Atlanta. Uh, this weekend, we will have an Ikebana demonstration featuring the executive master and master uh, from the Ichio um, Ikebana Society here in Atlanta and Ichio Art Center. Uh, all the proceeds from that program will actually go toward to support the Peace Bell Project in which we are building a authentic Japanese uh, bell tower uh, at the Carter Center. Uh, you can learn more about the Peace Bell Project on our website at www.jasgeorgia.org. So definitely come out to Nakato Restaurant to uh, get a glimpse into uh, Ikebana. Um, and speaking of baseball, uh, actually uh, later this month, uh, March 20, uh, sorry, May 29th, uh, we are going to have the Atlanta Braves Japan Day out in which the Consul General of Japan here in Atlanta will serve as the honorary captain of the game uh, and we'll be playing uh, the Miami Marlins. So definitely cheer on the world champion Atlanta Braves uh, as they kind of uh, get back on schedule uh, to coming back home uh, after a road trip. Uh, all the proceeds actually uh, from that, those ticket sales will go help proceed to the Peace Bell Project as well. So definitely come check us out at the Braves game. Uh, and to celebrate uh, Asian American Pacific Islander Month, uh, we are going to have a online and virtual film screening of First to Go, uh, a short film uh, about the Japanese American experience uh, in the internment camp uh, during World War II. Um, and we will have a director talk uh, after the film uh, screening as well. Uh, that's coming up on May 31st, so definitely join us. Uh, and then to kind of uh, uh, finish us out uh, for uh, May and June, we have a washoku uh, demonstration in which the official chef of the Consul General of Japan will be showing us how to make mizuyokan, uh, a Japanese uh, summer uh, kind of dessert, uh, and how to make that uh, uh, not only at a restaurant, but you can also kind of learn how to make it at home as well. Uh, and then we also have a origami workshop uh, coming up in July as well. So uh, a lot of events coming up. Definitely join us for all of our exciting activities. But uh, thank you again to Mr. Robert Whiting for joining us today and uh, kind of sharing your experience and uh, kind of the history of the past 60 years in Tokyo. Look forward to uh, kind of reconnecting again. Thank you, Jim and Georgia Tech Cyber for being our promotional partner. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Be safe.